And it is November 4th, 2015. And it is 2.20 a.m. in the morning. Yes, it is. And um, what an eventful day. I tell you, God has me laughing every single day in an enormous amount. Okay? Um, just as I was about to go to, to sleep, I get, a I get a, a picture from my daughter-in-law of Remy reading a book. Yeah. Reading a book. And I'm looking at him. I was like, Mr. Is what is Mr. Oh my God. And I'm telling you, I look at this picture of Remy and, and, and I said, this boy it, it, it's like, he's a, it's like, he's a grown person. I said, from dancing to reading a book, and it kind of reminds me of Kermit the Frog, you know, with sipping in tea. So anyway, um, you know, I remember, you know, uh, on Saturday was Halloween. He had his Bruce Lee costume on and everything. And, you know, I just want to give you a little background information because I was contemplating because um, I ended up sending the video to a few of my girlfriends. And I had more laughs after that, not laughing at Remy. It's just such an enjoyment to watch how the boy, this boy just born. He just born and he's reading the book, reading the book. You'll see the picture for yourself. But what's interesting and hilarious is my response to, um, something is because, you know, I'm so filled with jokes now. It's just, I'm just on a roll. I am on a roll here. And, um, and if you don't find it funny, that's too bad because I find it funny. I find it to be absolutely hilarious. So anyway, um, what, where I'm being led to is, is talking about parenting and what I haven't discussed, what particular parenting, this is about grandparents, grandparents of children who are adults that have children. <clears throat> so in other words, I'm talking about young grandparents who are probably in their forties, fifties, and you have young adult children who have babies that are not really taking care of their children the way that you think they should. And you're the one that had to do most of the work and you're guiding them. They're probably not listening. You feel frustrated. You feel like you're taking care of the child yourself. Uh, you know, they're not really, uh, they need more guidance or so on and so forth. And it can be quite frustrating. Now I'll admit when I had my children, I had my children young. Also, I was 19, 20 when I gave birth to my first son I know my mom had complained and told my aunt, you know, I used to always have her at the babysitter, da 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 da. So I had my mom, I had my grandmother, I had my sister. My oldest son was the worst baby you could ever want to babysit in the whole world because he would cry and bawl and miserable. Oh my God, it was amazing uh, in a weird way. And he didn't want to go to anybody but me or his dad. So anyway, um, and I know it's one of the, a parent's worst nightmare is to have, you know, the worst babysitters you could ever have. You know, and nobody takes care of your child better than you. But I know what it's like as a young parent, that is a lot of responsibilities. And I know when you want to have your own freedom, because I know that I used to take care of my son, my oldest son, and I used to take care of my, my brother, Sean. And so when I first got my job, I wanted to just get out the house. I just wanted my own space. And I'm like, screw this in a, in a little way. I want some time for me. I want out and I would leave my son and go about my business and um and then come back in the evening or whatever just to have some time for me and then i got my first job and then that's when my grandmother had to take care of my son for me so i remember quite clearly so i know what it's like on both sides of the coins okay but the one thing for sure is i always took care of my son meaning i made sure he's fed bathed, you know everything my mother she is such a conscious woman she was very conscious of us being fed bathed and everything um everything to who i am i got it straight up from my mother okay and so the reason i'm having this conversation um like i said on both sides because i remember what it was like on the end of being a mom a young mother because i was a young mother i was 20 when i had my son and i know what it was like on my mother's end when she uh she also had to be there guiding me as a young grandmother and taking care of grandchildren while i was there in the house um, I also have a friend who, and my sister is a young grandmother because my niece, she had a child at a young age and she still had to end up doing everything. My grandniece, um, Nia, she actually called, um, my sister, she called her Nana, but you know, as soon as my sister comes home, she runs, she would run straight to her for everything instead of to her own mother. 
So my, my sister ended up really being the mother more than my, my, um, my niece being the mother. And the same thing for my girlfriend, Marcia. She was going through a similar thing. She's the one that really mostly was doing things for her grandson, Nicholas, more than her daughter. And so, of course, the love that you have for your grandchild, it supersedes, like, tumultuously, you know, with how you feel than your own children. Not that you don't love your own children, but it's a different kind of love. And, um, and still, I know with discussions that I've had with my sister, with Marcia... Uh, there was always something that they would talk about that was perturbing to do with the care of their grandchildren. And where would you have to be either cursing them off, you have to be fussing with them, what they didn't do. Uh, there's things you want to just ignore and things that you couldn't ignore. You know, the list goes on and on. You know, I could have a, a, a like an interview that could go on for days when it comes to this. So as it as be that as it may, neither one of them are living with um, you know my sister or with Marcia, uh, and I know they have they have become instant babysitters to within their own right and so on and so forth. So Remy, I would I either see him every other weekend or on weekend, you know whatever. And so of course with a younger baby, it's a lot more responsibility. It sure is. It's a lot more responsibility. And for me, I'm very nurturing, and the one thing that I am, I'm very, very sensitive when it comes to babies. So, of course, I have five children, and very much I'm experienced when it comes to children. I communicate with babies. I know what they're feeling, thinking, saying, doing, whatever. I can sense their needs and desires, just as well as pets, animals, plants. I'm very in tune to all of life and nature and all things, people, plants, places, things, objects, whatever. So, um... <laughs> So what's interesting is, once again, I go back to this picture with Remy. Because I remember when he uh, was communi communicating with me telepathically because he was ready to start solid foods. And I was the one that started him on his first set of solid foods. And um, and so I told his parents, you know, guiding them along the way what they needed to do. And I told them, you know, they, they should feed him how many times a day, you know, and start him on finger foods and all this stuff. Um... And so that's what I started doing. So, and I told them he's still to continue on his milk and his formula. You know, typical things that the doctor is supposed to teach them to do and all that stuff. But still, I know as young parents, you learn as you go along the way, you know. And forming eating habits and sleeping habits with each child is different, okay. Because your child conforms to your habits, your sleeping habits, your eating habits, what you say, uh, you know, reading, talking, speaking, you know, your energy. Um, whenever Remy comes over, uh, to stay with me, he hardly sleeps. So, you know, everybody's laughing and saying, oh, when he comes, I said, because you don't sleep. Well, everybody knows my children, my youngest children, especially, they never wanted to sleep. They always wanted to be around me. And I was the same with my mother. I always wanted to be around her everywhere she went. So my two youngest, they, they were the same way. Also my third son, Damon, same thing. Always want to be around me all the time. So anyway, um, <clears throat> What I'm leading up to is um, the young people. I know it's a wonderful thing to say, I want to have a child, or you have a child. I remember Kimberly, Marcia's daughter, Kimberly. I remember when she wanted to have a child too, and I told Marcia, I said, she sure is she ready for the baby, yeah. And, um, and I know that it turned out to be a lot more than she thought, and I know she loves Nicholas, but it's a lot more than you expect. Same thing with Stephanie. It's a lot more than you expect. It's a lot more responsibility than you expect. I'm pretty much sure David and Joe say the same thing too. It's a lot more than you expect. That's right. And um, so the thing is, is that this is also about being conscious and connecting consciously with your child. So it's not just say, oh, I have a pretty baby, put on clothes, or you don't put on clothes, and, uh, you know, and that's that. This is also about connecting to your children and knowing their needs and wants. You're taking care of a little person here. That means that they're also forming their own personalities. There is an observation being made by them, and they also have messages to give to you too as well. This is a part where you understand that they are an extension of you, Okay. They are an extension of you in how you're being. And they come first too, as well as you coming first. And it, and both of you play a major role in each other's lives. And it's not just about you anymore. It's also about your baby. 
I know that there's also periods where you may go through depression and sadness and stuff like that because you're taking care of a child that you can't just send them back someplace. They're yours for keeps. Remember that movie, For Keeps? I always recommend young people watch that movie, For Keeps. See what it's like to take care of a baby. It is a major responsibility. A major responsibility. There is no going back once that process starts. When it comes to the pregnancy, the doctor's visits, then we get to the stage of uh, delivery, postpartum, the pampers, the changing, the formulas, the feedings, the doctor's visits, the boo-boos, the bathing, okay, the shopping, the groceries, everything. It's a lot of responsibility, a lot. If it's a girl combing the hair, the boy taking them to the barber shop, right? The crying, the whining, the bawling, you know. Hopefully, thankfully, prayerfully, there's hardly any illnesses. Okay, so the list goes on and on to the amount of responsibility that you do have when it comes to a child. There comes a time when you might want to do certain things and you got to think twice because what? Then, you know, who's going to watch the baby? What are you going to do? You know, you don't, you feel as if there's not as much freedom as you had before. But I tell you this, I took my church with me almost everywhere that I went. Just about everywhere that I went. Except, you know, a party or so. It all depends. You know, and I remember people used to say, God, everywhere you go, there were your boys. There were your children. Yes, that's exactly what I did, no matter what. So I, I want you young people to understand the, I, I won't use the word consequences. I more want you to understand and get the realization of what it is when you're taking care of a little person or persons. It is a major factor when it comes to that choice of having that child. And so now we're talking about a union between two and this is not about just having sex and the chances you take with having or making creating love here and that there's another being that may or may not come into existence and what unfolds and comes thereafter we are making changes here on the planet and the changes include who you are allowing to come into your space when it comes to your bodies your mind and your soul Okay, remember I read the article that even your thoughts and what's occurring when you're having sex with someone, what kind of energy you're creating here. You know, that if you do become pregnant, then what kind of soul are you having to enter into that space of creation? You see, it is well worth the wait for who you are going to allow to have explore with you with your body and their body as virgins. It's worth the wait for you to have your true love that you're an expression and an embodiment of love. It is worth the wait. It's not worth it to put yourself into a position where you encounter and have these lower energies that brings on more problems within you. You see what I'm saying? Than what's necessary. So it is worth it. It's a lot more that can happen if you put yourself in a position to become pregnant or pregnant someone else and it's a lower vibration and then if you have a little person come along and then you know the the, the, the cycle that continues that that happens and to what occurs it can be enormous and and depressing and difficult narcissistic and you know the it's it's, it's it just can go on and on and on and so it's important to be conscious even from a level to do with yourself before you even get started in any type of partnership with someone or your true divine, uh, you know, compliments of each other. It's a new type of relationship we're talking about here of a higher realm. And so now parents, what are and how are you being when it comes to your young adult children? The ones that you have that may still be at home or the ones who may be in a relationship or are the ones who may, uh, may be in a relationship or not anymore. And there's a child involved. Are you How much are you constantly doing for your children instead of allowing them to mature and make uniform decisions for themselves without interfering? How much input are you giving to them? How much are you investing in yourself or how much are you contributing to yourself so that way there's a reflection or something that is to be seen by that young adult? Because, you know, if you are telling a young person how they should be, but you're not practicing it yourself, how can you expect them to be doing the same thing if you're not doing it yourself? You know, what are you doing? 
How are you reflecting through them for them to also be a reflection of you based on your relationships, based on your relationships that you have with yourself and the one that you may have with a significant other or your neighbor, et cetera, et cetera, and et cetera. This is about divine, true partnerships. And that includes a partnership that you have with yourself. If you have low self-esteem, if you feel that you're not worthy, if you feel that all men suck, or if you feel that all women are bitches, then how do you think your children are going to feel and react when it comes to their relationships? How do you think they're going to treat their own children? How do you think it keeps passing on from one generation to the next? So it's important to really pay attention to the family, the family within you, how you treat one another, the dynamic of the relationship, how much communication is taking place, especially what kind of communication is everybody walking around the house, texting each other too, even though you're upstairs and downstairs. I remember when my mom was alive, we used to call each other on the phone and, you know, we're like, hey, she's upstairs, I'm downstairs. You know, people are like, God, don't you, don't you live in the same house? But, you know, my mom and I, we were always in constant communication. I mean, life was just full of excitement when it came to us talking and what, you know, and everything that we needed to discuss, dreams, what's going on in our lives. I mean, that is how close my mom and I are. Very, very close. And so... um, I understand also the parents' frustration when you want what's best for your children, your grandchildren, you do your best that you can, you want everything to work out for them, but at the same time, you want them to also get it within themselves to what their responsibilities are. You want them to connect consciously as far as how they should be in terms of their relationship and what they're doing for their children, and and especially a baby, you know? So I know there's a lot of parents out there shaking their heads saying, oh my God, I know what you're talking about. You know, I mean, in my case, I thought I would have, I would have stopped talking to David when it comes to him. And, and I tell you, when I saw that this baby didn't have his dinner, I cursed him off like a sailor. So I'm going to play something. Okay. Cause I don't want to make it seem like I'm lecturing here, but I wanted it. I wanted to explain the changes, which it still comes back to you. The mother, the mother, the queens, you know, as you are in your queenship, your daughters, your sons, they will also fall into place based on how you are being also as parents. And even if your children are adopted or, you know, it's a grandparent or something, it's still the same thing. It doesn't have to necessarily be on the same bloodline as a mother, father, wherever you are in as a group collectively in a household, regardless of the ratio, it's still something that is being instilled from, you know, who is together in alignment at the time and place to where you are. So if you're all under one roof together, there's something dynamic as a family to what changes are taking place right now. And that's what counts. That's what matters. And so you ask yourself this question, are you Are you in a position to invoke the change? Are you in a position in a frame of mind to say, hey, this is what I choose. I'm ready for this. I know that I've been waiting for this for a very long time. What do I do? It's not about what do you do. It's how you're being. What are you being? What are you being? Where do you go from here? It starts from within. It starts from within. Sometimes there's a time where you don't do anything anymore to help your children. They have to get it themselves. So parents, stop spoon feeding your children all the time. Sometimes you may do it and sometimes you don't. Sometimes you may give an input and sometimes you don't. And that's just the way it is. That's the way it should be. And that's a part of honoring yourself because when you honor yourself, your children honor yourself. And your children's children honor themselves. You see? And then there's a time when you're going to play. So when you play, your children play. Your grandchildren um, play. There's a balance right here. That's what balancing is all about. There's a huge difference. So anyway, so as you see the picture with Remy, I I was back and forth, you know, should I play the video? Should I not play the video? But you know what? 
the video that uh, is uh, the video that I uh not video excuse me I said picture it's actually an audio recording that I made this morning it's two of them actually because I sent the picture to Marcia uh, with Remy reading his book based on his mother sending it to me which I was just in such tickle pink and um I wrote to Marcia saying this child is amazing if only is I said if only him would master sleeping sometimes lol you know because since he's there mastering holding the book as a boyfriend can master um sleeping also but i was just saying that for fun because i know remy's not really sleeping as such because you know he's involved with the spirit also in the energy and the shift i mean he's actually anchored uh where he is as an embodiment um as far as the children that are coming in the children that are here to help with the shift that's taking place with the planet that's why he's here so he's already doing and being whoever he is to be for all the changes that are happening right now. That's exactly what he's doing. So anyway, Marcia then writes to me and says, good morning. This is wild. I was just getting ready to send you something and I WhatsApp and I was, and I was going to WhatsApp you, but see what well, she says. See ya, Jesus. Amazing. Um, smart. She was talking about Remy being amazing and smart. So I'm going to play one, the first part of the first recording, um, that I'm talking about where I'm talking about, uh, uh, the the uh, the picture, and um, and also making mention of the fact that um, making making mention of the fact that Remy is, is so engaged in the book, and I'm gonna play the next recording after that because that time now I'm discussing with Marcia that um, you know because I was cursing and you know I was cursing everything to do with David because of the fact that Remy was hungry and he took so long to bring the food for him. And he act like it's like it's no big deal, nonchalant, and saying to me, "Well, I shouldn't have taken Remy because they were planning to go home to feed him." But I'm saying, "Well, what the heck time is that going to be?" Because it was almost like quarter to nine, and he said he was going to the car to get the food. Meantime, at the bat station, him done yam feed food already and all kind of crap. Him and and um and Joe. <coughs> so, I then thought to myself, "My God, every time it seems to be an issue with him feeding Remy on time or whatever, and the bullshit." So I'm there cursing like a sailor. Gonna let you know that from now. I was cursing like a sailor. So if you feel you don't want to hear it, then just fast forward. You know, you do have a right to do that. So, but then again, you'll miss out on the laughs. So I um I couldn't help myself. That's all I couldn't help myself. Because when I'm looking at the book, I said, rotted. I said, look like as if Remy uh looking for food in the book because since he never he never getting food on time the way he was supposed to. When I saw the uh, the picture, so that's what this is all about. So I'm gonna play both recordings. Um, I did not know this was gonna happen because, like I said, God has me on a roll with laughing every day. I mean, my cheeks are still hurting me from seeing Godfrey, and I've been laughing for the past two weeks, nonstop, nonstop. It doesn't make a difference whether I had a costume or not, whether I'm on stage or not. Somehow, the spirit has me laughing and laughing and laughing. So here goes. Here's the first recording. I was just getting ready to finally go sleep for the for the morning, night, whatever. And Joe said, this man dead with love. He said, this little boy, you know, he's here at all, you know. From dancing to this, no, he, he, he is the first that I picked him. He said, no, sir, me, me I laugh, me tell Joe, me said, thank you for the love. Mm -mm. He is too much. And, he, and David said, ever since he, um... Ever since he stayed with me that weekend, he don't sleep at all. He don't sleep at all. He stay up all night, all day, all night. Only sleep one hour. That's it. He said, thanks a lot, mommy. He said, you're welcome. Any problem? No problem at all. <laughs> Are you back, a bitch? Remy, they're a fiend, yeah. They read the book in you know, there in my yard. Remy not sleep because Remy know that um, the energies that, uh, you know, he should stay awake because he's not missing anything. That's all there is to it. I mean, I miss no excitement. They, they, they are Dave and Buster's with me, and they put them um, on Saturday, and David never feed them. I said, I said, one piece of something, I tell Dave what he blood clot. But if you feed the pit, you pit, you bright arm. Um, you know, Remy go on bad and stiff out himself and have temper and mad like a cock. I'm so fucking hungry. I tell Dave what he bomb a clot. You say that, please, you know, I mean, I give a fuck. Remy tell so got it and David I don't know about oh you wanna keep it for the rest of the weekend. Me say me have my plan them. You wanna see what they rat in my boy who who tell him to go take away um become a take away for um for going at a place. He said, Me say me never see a boy like him so fucking feisty. Mm. 
unbelievable. I said, if I never take the picnic to ride, you put the picnic and start about all oh, you, they were going to take him home. So I said, if it's nine o'clock in the fucking night and it takes 40 minutes to reach your yard, you're going to feed a bit of in dinner, fucking 10 o'clock. Maybe if I take a piece of bread, get a bit of for eat because I'm pretty hungry. I said, soon to some blood clot, kung fu, and a bomber clot. They my Bruce Lee costume, and I'm soon to some kung fu, bomber clot, Bruce Lee, and for them Ross clot. I said, <laughs> Any shit like this. Then a white man I try to pick me. <laughs> they laugh, yeah. I mean, I'm a baby. I got me to be asleep. I can't even can't see I'm going just stop. I can't look at my room, but I'm going to read book. And then, look like I'm going to book. I'm going to see if I can get info. I don't know if I can get info. I forgot about food. <laughs> So there you go. That was my conversation I had this morning that I left on WhatsApp for Marcia and I passed it on and I just keep laughing and laughing and laughing and laughing and laughing just from looking at the picture at Remy and what I've had. And I, and I look back and I think, and I say, you know, because my, I said it to my sister, my sister said, Oh, I'm listening to it. And you just cussing so much. And I said, Oh, you don't understand when it comes to David and Brandon, Talking delicate flower doesn't work. And so when I when I was walking with Brandon it, through the parking lot while I was at the mall, and I said to Brandon, because Brandon gives me so much talking, and I said, oh, your auntie just said that, you know, I'm, you know, I cussed too much, and I was cussing, and she was playing with her. So I said, oh, she must think, say, I'm going to be like, oh, Brandon, please listen to me. I'm your mother. Oh, you think that way work? That not work. And David, when David go on with his freshness with feeding mouth, when he say, oh, nobody didn't tell you to go take no um, to go take the baby and go about your business. When in freshness, when me trying to feed him and take care of him, what? In too fiesty. So that's why I hear all the nasty barrels. So I said I have to be like old nigger. And, and Brandon is like, oh, what's an old nigger? So you see, we have to understand that there's all these different sides to ourselves that invokes and comes out. To be the best that we can be. That's right. You see? All the different aspects to ourselves. And so even as parents, when it comes to rearing children and and when you think that, you know, oh, when they reach a certain age, things are going to be different and we're going to be different. And, um, you know, we also have times that change that goes with the change that comes with the children. You know, you think that things will improve in them, but we have to understand we're also working with personalities and we're also dealing with the times that change as well. So, Hey, now we're dealing with energy and we're dealing with a uh, new earth, right? And, uh, personality, right? Different personality. That's not been written when it comes to the children. It's a whole new dynamic. So now you say to yourself, well, what do we do with this? How do we handle this? Well, it's not about handling. Because you know what? This is something coming natural. Because remember I did mention before that eventually we're not going to have to 
worry or concern ourselves about, you know, physically disciplining our children. Um, because I told you before that I've had to physically discipline my children. I'm not going to lie to you. I mean, this is just the way it is as far as in my household. And um, it has come to a point where I know that the, the only physical discipline that I do right now currently as we speak is that if I have to take my fingers and dig it into their their are arms or something like that, then so be it. So I'm not going to be pretending and saying, Oh, darling, don't do that. Heck no. Okay. And I have a different relationship when it comes to my children. And I don't believe in talking, talking over and over and over again. Like when you hear that thing talking about, Oh, no fear me talk. You know, I fear the same thing. Oh, for no, no, me not like that. You know, my children know me and my friends know me. I don't choose to, nor do I like to repeat things three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times. So, and that's how it is with me. So anybody else in their household that wants to throw stones and criticize and judge and stuff like that, that's your problem. Because the one thing for sure, you will not hear about my children being in jail, being psychopaths, running around, doing this here and there, none of that shit. Okay. And my children are intelligent beings. We have uh, open relationship. When I say open relationship, meaning that we can talk about anything and all things. As I said before, anything and all things. My children are not a hundred percent. They're not perfectionists because I allow them to be who they are. And at the same time, they have to, they must respect me as their mother. I told you, I told David off good and proper when I was in that restaurant, I didn't give one flying feather. Okay with whatever it is because I told him, I said, I am his mother and I'm the only mother he could ever have. There ain't no other mother he gonna have because we only have one mother. I would give anything to be able to talk to my mother on the phone. How many of you out there reach out to your mother? How many of you treasure your mothers, the ones who are honorable, of course? Take the time to appreciate your moms. Don't wait for Mother's Day to appreciate your mothers. As I said before, I would give anything to be able to talk to my mom and to hug her physically right now, okay? I know she's here with me. It's not the same. But I tell you this though, time heals. It sure does. The veil is getting thinner. It is, you know, and we are all still one and we're all on one accord here. So let's reach out and love one another and let's work on ourselves. As you work on yourselves and everything starts to fall into place naturally as you are becoming true families yourself. So becoming a true family is not just me, it's you, me, and it's all of us, okay? And that means that we're staying as authentic. Do you hear the words I'm using? Authentic as we are, not possible. You notice I didn't say the word possible. We are remaining and stay authentic as we are. There is no need to hide anything here and pretend and, you know, and stuff and et cetera and et cetera and et cetera. Okay. So you heard me raw and informed. There is no need for me to pretend because I will tell you about your part at the same time. I'm still singing and praising God. Hallelujah. And I am blessed and highly favored and I am still being me and my children know me to who I am. And let me tell you something, when it comes to me disciplining my children, you think I'm going to go in a closet or go in the bathroom to dismantle? No, me right in the open, in the open area, telling them about themselves so they know how they are to behave and how they're to be. So me not busy, me staying on my zone when me I talk to them. And if anybody here, then me not business with that. They can't take it with them and go along with it same way. Okay. And I'll interpret that. They can take it with them wherever they go. Because, you know, who knows if someone else hears it and they say, wow, I need to talk to my children like that too for them to listen to me in a certain way and to understand, to come to an, a place of understanding. Because, you know, it starts from when they're young too. But then it's not about just when you say when it starts because there's a lot of patterns and, and concepts and behaviors that we take on from when we were younger, okay? And there's certain things that um, it's not. I'm going to repeat this majority of the time when it has come to raising my children, it has not been based on what I do. It has been based on how I've been, how I'm being demonstration. Okay. It does take patience. It does take wisdom. It does take understanding. There is no special formula. There is no special book, but I can tell you that based on how I'm being, that is how my children are being. And I go this way and I go that way. I do things unexpectedly that my children don't expect me to be. I do things spontaneously. I keep the faith. 
I stay strong within myself. I stay within my level of joy. Even when the chips are down and the children have been with me through thick and thin, up and down, left and right, good and bad. They have seen and witnessed all my, my ups, my downs, my highs and my lows. They've seen how things that seem frightening with the banging down on the doors and things that uh, could have been taken away from me. And they've seen how I've held my head high and I'm still here. And they've witnessed that, you see, and they're not afraid and they know, they know. So if the one thing I can tell you this is that they have also become stronger within themselves and not give up that even if someone else tries would have tried to tell them anything less than that they can't they can't and they won't go less than that you know why because it's not because i just say oh don't go less than that no it's because they've seen it through me and in me that's why it's not because I put it on a bulletin board. It's not because I made an announcement. But I know that at the time when anything occurs, I point it out for them to see it. And I teach them about appreciation. I allow them to understand the level of appreciation. So not just teaching them, but when they're going through the experience that they understand and go come to a level of appreciation. And so even if it includes your adult children to come to a level of appreciation, then so be it. Because sometimes it takes them to go through that in order for them to have a better understanding of themselves and how they too are changing when it comes to their own children. And so I know a lot of families, they tend to rely on how they should be with their children based on what's happening with their own lives and, you know, and anything else for the matter. And so another thing too, Spirit is reminding me, is that sometimes in life, things change and it can change in two years uh, three years in a month in seconds and minutes things are not always or necessarily going to be the same so it could be a round table or a square table it could be uh, a radio show or a talk show i'm just giving you an example so there's no need to hold on to a rigidity and thinking that uh you know with with life that it's it's just based on um one way, just one way that something can happen. It can be more than one way, more than one concept, more than one idea. So anyway, allow yourself to be, as I said before, allow yourself to be and allow spirit to guide you <clears throat> when it comes to your children. Don't judge yourself. Don't criticize yourself. Because if you do that, your children are going to feel that they should also be criticizing and judging themselves. And you start to spiral into the judgmental, go by the book category. And the next thing you know, you're, you're, you're being analyzed and, uh, and, and, and placed on some type of psychoanalysis here. And that's not what this is all about. So I will leave you in peace with those words. I would love to, which I'm going to do right now, to uh, honor and dedicate a few songs in memory of Miss Carmen. Yesterday uh, marks three years since she had passed away. And it's so funny, I was driving and I said, oh, let me play some music. And all of a sudden I think about the salsa. And I was like, oh my God, I just remembered she passed away three years ago, and she is, I won't say she was, like a mom to me. And so she's one of those souls that, uh, you know, she's a tough cookie. And she was, like, not just a mom to me, but she was also one to always give me advice. And she would also cook. She's a great cook, and she always would give me coquito and everything. And every party she had, she'd invite me, I'd go. She knows how much I love to dance. And, you know, and I'm like a daughter to her. And she was always guiding me all the time, all the time. So even up until two weeks or I say a week before she passed away, I, I went to visit her and, um, and she gave me information. And I will never forget that as long as I live. As long as I live. 
So, Miss Carmen, I just want to let you know I love you. And um, you mean the world to me. I am so thankful and grateful for you having entered my life when you did. And I thank you for messages and your guidance and your love. Always. Always, always, always. Yo te amo. And so I dedicate all these songs to you from this on this day. It is now November 4th, 2015. But I will always, always keep you in my heart. And I will always remember everything that you've taught me that will never leave me. And if the one thing that you have taught me, of course, is unconditional love even more. Because the love that you have for your children and your grandchildren... The amount of sacrifices that I've seen you make for them. Um, I mean, I thought more so that you spoiled them so much more than ever. But I know because you you always did your best and you, you, you kept up that front. I have to say front. That even when you were going through all the stuff you went through, you still took the time to help others. So I truly wanted to tell you from my heart how much I love you, which you know that I do. Because I know one thing for sure. When you were here in the physical... I told you how much I love you. And so I'm saying it again that I love you with all my heart and I'm thankful for you. I am thankful for you having entered to and touched and helped so many lives. And I know that you're continuing to do so even now. And so once again, I dedicate, uh, you know, these songs, the songs that it's always played at, you know, um, the parties that you always had. And I sure do miss you. I sure do taking that ride out to Harlem so I can get me some Spanish food. But you know, if the one thing for sure is that you have invoked in me to always remember the Spanish in me. And also the music, the dancing, the laughter, and of course, most naturally, the coquito.